Welcome back to part two of the uh, visit to USS Slater. I am very honored to be in the presence of uh, Ryan Zemanski and, and welcome all the Battleship New Jersey folks uh, and, and the COD folks. Uh, we're here on the uh, aft deck of USS Slater and an absolutely beautiful museum ship. Uh, she is the queen of the fleet and, and really world-class restoration. I'm leaning on a K-gun here and uh, I, I'm a little nervous because uh, after 47 years with COD, leaning on things that were designed to kill my sub are a little disconcerting. Uh, but looking at uh, the collection here of depth charges, on the K-Gun we have a Mark VI depth charge uh, sitting in its arbor uh, and I, I'm happy to see that the, the stops are in place so this isn't going anywhere. And I believe the shell that fits in here to actually propel this about 70, 80 yards. Ryan, really, let's not. Uh, yeah, let's... These are artifacts. Yeah, right in there. I don't want to drop that all the way in because I guarantee you it won't come out when I do it. But you get the idea. You got a powder case in here and that's going to blow this thing uh, uh, 50 to uh, 100 yards or more uh, away from the ship to create a pattern. Um, Ready? Do you want to get that sub? No. No, no, we haven't confirmed whether it's friendly or not. No sub is friendly. Besides, if he surfaces and uh, it's Kurt Jurgen on the bridge, we're going to salute each other. You know, The Enemy Below, a movie I absolutely hate because it's so inaccurate. But anyway, that'll create some controversy. Yeah, it's nowhere near as good as U571. Das Boat, period. Leave it alone. Now, I'm looking at these depth charges, and Tim Rizzuto, who is the mastermind behind uh, the restoration of Slater. I mean, he has secret techniques that he will not share. But um, looking at these depth charges, there are some common features. This is the depthinator. Um, this is the one on the Mark VI. Basically, it's a... Look at that. You know, and you set <clears throat> the depth that you want it to burst at. Now, all depth charges should be until the moment you're going to start using them set to safe. That's important because if the ship you're on sinks, you don't want these things exploding at a preset depth below the survivors. The Japanese had a nasty habit of presetting their depth charges. And uh, we have personal experience with uh, two Japanese ships that we sank where the lion's share of the survivors were then killed by their own depth charges exploding as the ship sank. But uh, let's say the uh, talker says set depth charges at 100 feet. Well, I'm going to turn this to uh, dial. Now, I'm looking at this, and this is the, the typical early war. So they start from safe 30, 50, 75, 100 feet, 150, maximum of 300 feet. Could they even get caught at crush depth with that? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, remember, you, you were diving. You know, these boats are on the surface absolutely until the last possible minute because you want to make best speed. Now you're crash diving, uh, so you're not going very deep. Uh, so it's, it's reasonable to expect 300 feet uh, would be sufficient, but the U-boats had to go deeper uh, for survival. And the later depthinators have a little inset here in the center. So uh, once you get to 300, you then turn the inner dial and that goes to 1,200 feet. 1,200? Yeah. Uh, so again, technology is advancing very rapidly during the war. Um, but uh, so we can see that the depthinators pretty much remain the same here. Um, I don't want to drop this. Oh, there we go. It's just the, the, the level of detail and, and, and accuracy is incredible. All the little tools, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this one is set for 75 feet. I'll talk to Tim. You want it set it to safe. Um, that, that, those are set to safe. Safe. That's very good. Um, now, when Tim got these, I, I can speak on this. <clears throat> After the war, the, uh, the depth charges were uh, demilled. The explosives were removed. And these depthinators were removed. So he could buy these things uh, when he was lucky enough to find them. Basically a scrap. Uh, and, but finding the depthinators, <clears throat> well, we were very happy to help uh, in that restoration in that we received a fully intact Mark IX depth charge. And um, we weren't, weren't supposed to have the depthinator. And I called Tim. I said, hey, Tim, you're the expert. I've got a Mark IX. Um, uh, 
what do I do with it? And he said, well, I can send you a resin uh, replica of the Depthinator. I said, I don't need that, it's got one. And then the phone call took a very chilling <laughs> uh, uh, turn. He said, this is before digital photography. He said, don't take it apart until I fax you schematics. And the next day I had my fax and, uh, and he's on the phone and uh, I had my tools. And uh, it turns out that everybody at the COD dock was backed off about 50, 60 feet. And I took it apart. Now the Deptonator is a stack of, of, of coffee cans of various diameters. And these things were just total. Do they look like that? Yes. Well, actually, these are all intact. But you can see some of these things are, are very thin cans. I mean, that's a can of soup you know, the thickness. Well, they were all rusted out pretty badly. So when I opened it up, there was a lot of stuff falling apart. But somewhere in here is a little uh, brass test tube, the fulminator mercury uh, detonator. And that fell off onto the ground. And uh, Tim said, that could blow your hand off. Uh, but it had been uh, sub uh, submerged in water. Oh, okay. A sub vet got himself hands on a depth chart. Now, of course, it didn't have any of the booster or primer. What we think is he got his hands on a training round like this, mm. where it's all here, including the little fulminate of mercury. Uh, but he kept it in and out of his in-ground pool for years, so that's why everything kind of corroded very badly. But uh, it was a cause for some concern among some of our sub-vets. Uh, that's why they backed off 50 feet. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we were able to send him that, that original depthinator. Uh, when, this was when he was that kid. Uh, but it's just amazing to see what it what it should look like, and again, the level of detail here is and, is and incredible. And all this hollow space would have been 300 pounds of Torpax. Uh, well, TNT early on, you know, again, constant improvements. Um, you know, uh, HBX uh, is the uh, uh, the bang in the uh, the hedgehogs. These uh, might have been Torpex late in the war, but again, Mark Six, VI, Mark Nine, and here's that blunt nose. The case is very thick to give it that downward uh, orientation as it's falling. Oh yeah, you can even see the, the weld seam where you've got the forward case at one thickness and then the, the after casing right. is, is completely different. And, and talking about uh, you know, uh, converting to wartime production, most of these cases are built by Ream, the hot water tank people. Huh. So if your hot water tank craps out in World War II, you might be boiling water on the stove because Ream is busy making tens of thousands of these uh, depth charges. And that's the thing, you might launch a hundred or more depth charges and still not kill a submarine. Usually one or two uh, 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 firings of Hedgehog and you're likely going to get them unless the sonar guy is stone deaf. Uh, but right after the war, they introduced deck launch homing torpedoes. And that is one and done. So that, again, uh, she's in a beautiful example, a history of anti-submarine warfare uh, in World War II. And uh, let's close that up. Almost looks like a barbecue grill. It really does, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, if you get a chance, please stop down at, at, at USS Slater here in Albany and just the, the level and completeness is, is incredible. Right, so check this out. You can have a depth charge all ready to go on its arbor, ready to fire. You've got three more on top and one more on the bottom. And to move it, because these are 200 pounds, those are 300 pounds, you've got the J Davit here that can help you hoist it. You've got to pull this out, roll it, get it up here. And then the only place where it'll come out is down here at the bottom. There's a relief cut in this side of it. So you can pull this post out and this will slide right over into position once you've gotten the new arbor loaded. Uh, these arbors fire with the depth charge and then they're gone. Kind of wasteful. But she's got roll-off racks astern as well. Yeah, let's go look at those next. So now we're back at the depth charge racks. The most I've ever seen on a ship that's got a long fantail is about 13 depth charges lined up. So you don't have all that many. There is depth charge stowage beneath the hatch there, two levels down. So you can store extra cans like this. And this is really neat. You can see 
the posts in here that you can remove to allow the depth charges to continue to roll. If you're in combat, you'll have one that's held in these feet right here. So you can hit the lever to release it and let it roll out. And then you'd have all these moves so the next depth charge just rolls into its place. Now, given the fact everything is functional here, we better be careful because Tim's our good friend, but if we drop a few ash cans in the Hudson River, I think uh, he's not joining us for lunch. You know, but uh, yeah, um, depth charges rapidly disappear from destroyers and destroyer escorts in the 50s, uh, supplanted by, at first, uh, a, a rocket-assisted homing torpedo, RAT. That's a Mark 43 built in Cleveland. Uh, and that is one and done. Uh, I, you know, they, they had a very, very uh, capable uh, acoustic homing system. Uh, and then of course that's later replaced by ASROC, which is a Mark 44 with a rocket booster. Again, increasing the range that you can engage the uh, submarine. Because here again, you're right over the submarine, but if you miss him, he can put a torpedo into you. Uh, the rocket-assisted torpedoes, you get maybe a uh, 1,000 or maybe 2,000 yards standoff. And as rockets, a couple of miles. Uh, again, keeping the bad guy further away from you. Uh, but uh, uh, today, um, you know, we still carry homing torpedoes. They're Mark 50s. Uh, but most of the, um, the anti-submarine uh, lethality is carried to the target or the datum by air assets, helicopters, or aircraft, and that's the thing I want to say. When we talk about destroyers and destroyer escorts, we tend to focus too much on the ship versus the submarine. But in World War II, this is one element in a, in a chain of uh, lethality for the U-boats. Uh, destroyer escorts are working in hunter-killer groups, so you always have air assets. So that aircraft is going to engage the submarine first, either with depth charge uh, bombs, uh, machine gun fire, um, and then, of course, after 1943, the Mark 24 Fido, which is a secret name for basically a homing torpedo. Uh, so when you see uh, actions, again, to diss on uh, the enemy below, there's one destroyer escort versus a U-boat. Well, in reality, that destroyer escort is never operating alone. He's got other destroyer escorts and they have a, a jeep carrier and aircraft overhead. So they're all working in conjunction. Which... And most importantly, they're all working to protect my battleship. That's the whole reason they're out there. We're nowhere near your battleships. They're hunter-killer groups. They're up ranging across the Atlantic, if we're talking U-boats, uh, alone based on signal intelligence, decrypting U-boat codes, Triton, the uh, code name for the U-boat codes, and they're, they know where the U-boats are roughly. So these, these special hunter-killer groups go to that, that point and hunt down the, the submarine and kill it, or in the case of U-505, capture it. Um, but yeah, the battleships have their own screenings, but you guys are protected by destroyers. There are no destroyer escorts screening uh, a proud battleship because we can't keep up. Yeah, not as fast battleships. Yeah. So these are, you know, and of course they were built to protect the convoys as well. Uh, so a convoy is moving very slowly. Uh, but so yeah, they're just one element in a in a mosaic to uh, to bring uh, to bring death to the U-boats. And of course, the final uh, statistics are very uh, telling. Uh, we understood from uh, the end of World War II, roughly right after, that we had killed nearly 80% of the U-boats. I mean, that's just an absolutely, I mean, heartbreaking for, for humanity, but, but a very chilling uh, 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 statistic. 80% of the U-boats don't come back, I mean, for the whole totality of the war. What we don't understand until the end of the Cold War is, what, uh, what damage were the U-boats able to inflict on the Allied merchant ships? Now, in comparison, uh, if we look at the American submarine campaign against the Japanese, we sank almost 70% of the uh, Japanese merchant fleet with our submarines. We lose about 17% of the submarine force, and that's 48 boats. We talk about 52, but four of those were groundings and engineering losses with no loss of life. But we lose 48 boats, and generally with their entire crews. So that's a very heartbreaking uh, uh, reality. 
But in comparison, the U-boats lose nearly 80% of their submarine force to achieve, and according to Clay Blair, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, and the first guy to really get the declassified Battle of the Atlantic reports, they weren't even able to achieve 1% loss or damage on the Allied merchant fleet. Let that sink in. You know, we destroyed almost three quarters of the, of the Japanese merchant fleet. The U-boats, for the entirety of the war, less than 1%. Now, it is a percentage. You know, if I gave you 1% of a dollar, that's a penny. If I give you 1% of $30 million, you're buying lunch. Um, and of course, we know there was the first and second happy times, but uh, the Allies had an incredible technological advantage over the Germans. Um, in World War I, the U-boats nearly starved Britain out of the war. So Britain has an incredible incentive to develop a lot of anti-submarine technologies in the interwar years. Um, and of course, when the war breaks out, we, we don't have enough ships and aircraft to carry that technological advantage. But by 19, late 42, early 43, we do. And again, if you're plotting, the, the, the loss of, of our merchant ships takes a steep downward trend, while the loss of the U-boats just about hockey sticks. Um, and again, all the little technology, the slight improvements we're talking about in, in depth settings and the, the design of the uh, depth charges, that all plays into that. We keep it secret uh, well into the Cold War. In fact, only at the end of the Cold War do we uh, uh, um, declassify the Battle of the Atlantic reports because the Western powers, so that's London, Washington, Ottawa, don't want the Soviets to learn anything from the mistakes of the U-boats um, because we understood that they were going to basically reprise the whole U-boat campaign had World War III broken out but only they would have had nuclear submarines and nuclear weapons. So uh, it's not until the mid mid 90s. So if you get a chance, read Clay Blair's Hitler's U-Boat War. And it's a very thick book. In fact, it's two volumes in the first printing. Just read the foreword and it's mind blowing. So um, how does it feel to be on deck that's only a quarter of an inch thick? and knowing that there is really no armor. I mean, does it make you feel uncomfortable? Oh yeah, especially given that, that like I said, we're, we're just two decks above the depth charge magazines where you got a bunch of these 300 pound uh, ash cans just stowed right there above a birthing space, or excuse me, below a birthing space. Well, I mean, you know, on submarines, the crewmen are living, uh, sleeping amid the torpedoes. So I, I, that doesn't make me feel uncomfortable. Just all of this anti-submarine uh, uh, weaponry makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, I know you've been sweating this whole episode. I've well, noticed. it's uh, it's hot. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, we could be here all day, uh, but let's just say, uh, give us a, a, a like, uh, a thumbs up, uh, hit the subscribe button, notification, and uh, We'll be back with more, maybe not with the uh, illustrious uh, Ryan, but uh, I'll be back with more and let's do some more stuff. Thanks for watching. Thank you.